I'm going to start a new series today. It's not a very long series. It's only about four weeks long. We're going to study Luke chapter 7. I'm calling this series, Four Things You Need to Know About Jesus. If you remember, we've just finished a series that I called Pear-Shaped, and I spelled it wrong because we were looking at how Jesus used pairs of things to teach us about his kingdom. It was a study through the Sermon on the Plain. It was Luke's attempt to show us how Jesus taught and the general principles of his teaching. In a message that I'm calling Admiration, today I'm going to start looking at what Jesus was like. Not just his teaching, but the way he behaved and the way he reacted. It's an important thing for us to study because we need to know what Jesus was like so that we know we can trust him. How can we trust Jesus if we don't know what his his personality and his temperament was like? Now, for some of us, we've trusted Jesus for decades, and this becomes something that hopefully becomes second nature. But for many, trust does not come easily. In our culture, we are taught not to trust. And I got a little pop quiz for you to help you figure out if that's something you've been taught. How many people, when you pulled into the church parking lot this morning, when you got out of your car, locked your door? Yeah. Yeah. Most of us did, didn't we? Locked your door because we don't live in a culture where just being in a church parking lot makes you safe. For some, it's even harder than that. Uh, It's a little bit of an older statistic now, but uh, I read a statistic one time that said that uh, one out of three young ladies had been mistreated in their childhood. Many of us have experienced, hopefully not something quite that bad, but we've you know, worked with that co-worker who took credit for the things that we did, or we trusted that boss for the, the raise that didn't come. Um, maybe our family didn't show up for that big family reunion we were part of planning. There's all kinds of things in our culture today that teach us that trust is not safe. And those are people we can see. The scripture asks us to trust Jesus who we can't see. So how do we deal with that? So one of the things that I think might help us is to look at Jesus and try to understand faith from his perspective. What did he think of when he thought of this concept of faith? And that's exactly what this passage illustrates for us this morning. It was read for us very well just a little, a couple of minutes ago, but we're going to look at it a little bit deeper. We're going to look and see how it starts out, and it starts out with a group of elders coming to Jesus with a plea. Starting in verse 1 in Luke chapter 7, it says, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, that's the chapter right before this, the Sermon on the Plain. So after he's given this message, he entered Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. This centurion... First, we have to know what a centurion is. Uh, It's from the Latin word for 100. He was an officer in the Roman army that had control of 100 people. But in this particular case, since we know a little bit about uh, Capernaum, which was on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee, uh, we know that he was probably there not in primarily a military role, although he would have still had that authority. He was probably there as part of the government. Romans author, Rome authority over the people of Capernaum. And he had, according to the passage, built a synagogue there because he loves the Jews. And when his servant got sick, he heard about Jesus, and he had enough knowledge of what the Jews believed to realize that something's going on here. So he sent for Jesus to come 
and heal the servant. Now, he could have sent a contingent of Roman soldiers. We really have to understand the amount of authority that a centurion in this role would have had. He could have sent a, a contingent of Roman soldiers to Jesus and said, you're coming or you're dead because this Roman had the authority over these people uh, to such a degree that he could execute them without having to ask anybody for permission. But he didn't do that. He sent the elders of the synagogue. And I'm really intrigued by the way they tried to get Jesus to come to this, to this Greek, this Gentile, really, person who was not a member of the Jewish community. He said he deserves it. He's built a synagogue for us. And, and when you read between the lines, you can just hear them thinking to themselves. And, and we want him to continue doing nice things for us. So we want you to do something nice for him so that he doesn't have an excuse to stop doing nice things for us. He's really, uh, we've really got him in a quid pro quo situation here. You know, he, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. He's earned it, and we want to reap the benefits from what he's earned. Notice Luke does not record a reply from Jesus at this point, only that he went with them. Starting in verse 6, it says, And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come, into my, come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. What a great demonstration of faith. This this Greek, I mean, I mean, really, we, we tend to call them Romans, but they had a Greek philosophy, and he was a Gentile, he was not born a Jew, recognizes that he's not worthy. He's not worthy to have Jesus come to him, to spend the time necessary to come and, and be in his presence. There might be some cultural issue in this, too, as well. Because in the Jewish mind, any Jew that went into the house of a Gentile was considered ceremonially unclean. In other words, tainted. And this Gentile knew enough about the Jewish culture to know that this rabbi who had authority to do things, who made his living teaching Jews, once he came into his house, would be unclean to be in the presence of the Jews, and he would lose income. That was going through the centurion's mind. He also recognized what authority was. He recognized that all he had to do was say the word, and his servant would be healed. He didn't have to come in and do some in-depth ritual. I, I think of um, Nahum. Remember that story in the Old Testament where uh, Nahum was a Syrian and he had leprosy and he came to Elisha to get healed. And Elisha said, well, just go swim in the Jordan for a little while and you'll be healed. And Nahum got mad. And he said, I thought, sure, he would come out and wave his hand over the, the disease and, and pray to his God and, and chant something and maybe sprinkle some dust on it and I'd be healed. All I got to do is go jump in the lake. And it made him mad. And so he didn't want to do it until somebody smarter than him, who was his servant, said, uh, look, it's not that much. Just go try it. And he got healed. I wonder if this centurion knew that story. I don't need a lot of ceremony. I don't even need to be recognized. I trust you to do what's right. That's the hidden thing in what the centurion says here. Your ministry, your teaching is more important than I get my servant healed. I trust you to do what's right. And if it's right for you to stay clean, 
and just say the word instead and, and my servant gets healed or, or if you even decide not to. I acknowledge your authority, your supremacy over me. And it's not saying too much to say that this absolutely blew Jesus away. Notice what it says in verse 9 here. When Jesus heard this thing, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, that means the Jews that had just been on the mountain with him, turned to the crowd and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. That word marveled can be translated to be in awe and not, oh, wasn't that cute faith. Ah, like, wow, that is amazing. I'm astounded that this man has that kind of faith. Especially, I, I got a feeling he upset those elders a little bit. Because they came trying to negotiate. Yeah, he did some nice things. Now we need to do some nice things so that he can keep doing nice things. And we'll have to do some nice things more. And, and we'll have a nice give and take relationship. But the centurions saw Jesus for who he was. Sovereign and gracious and wise. Wise enough to know the right way to respond. And then Luke says that Jesus healed the man. Or did he? Verse 10 surprises me. Jesus says at the end of verse 9, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Verse 10 says, and when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. I have to remember, Luke is a physician. Not only is he recognized by important historians as one of the most reliable records of the time, the best historian, one, his, one modern historian called him, the best historian of his time was Luke. But he was a physician. He was a doctor. He was interested in the process that Jesus would have went through. But the way Luke portrays this is... The friends came from the house, said, Jesus, we understand you don't need to actually go there. Don't, don't mess up your, your own plans. Just say the word and it'll be done. And Jesus just looked at him and turned around and walked away. Can you imagine what the crowd thought? This centurion just made Jesus mad and he's not going to go anymore. Well, those folks who came with the message, probably thought, oh no, how did we, we said it wrong, something bad happened. But when they got back to the house, the centurion isn't just improving. The centurion is perfectly healthy. I'm sorry, the centurion's servant is perfectly healthy. Jesus reacted in a way that was unexpected. Now, that's the outline of the story. Let's stop for just a second here and make uh, three or four observations about this passage. First thing I want to notice is that Jesus and the centurion never met. And for me, that's encouraging because that's the way all most of us have to relate to Jesus. I mean, if I, uh, if I had another pop quiz and asked you to raise your hand if you've seen Jesus face to face, most of us would not raise their hands. In fact, the last time I remember that I know for sure that somebody saw Jesus face to face was John on the Isle of Patmos, and John claimed that was in a vision. So the time before that, according to Scripture, would have been Paul on the road to Damascus saw Jesus face to face. The rest of us, all the way through history, for 20, 2,000 years now, 20 centuries, have had to know Jesus without a direct face-to-face -face contact. I think Jesus knew that. I think Jesus knew it would be that way. And it's part of the reason why the Spirit inspired this story. Because the centurion was rewarded for his faith. And we, who also haven't seen Jesus face-to-face, -face, are going to be rewarded for our faith. Second thing I'd like to observe is that there's no proclamation of healing. For Luke, as a 
uh, physician, I would have expected him to record the process of the healing, but he didn't. And I interpret that to mean there was no process. There simply was nothing that Jesus said. And Luke accurately recorded that. And sometimes Jesus is going to act in our lives in ways that are unexpected as well. Or contrary to our expectations. And when he does, that shouldn't shake our faith. Jesus' administration, I'm sorry, admiration is based on faith. Notice this centurion's response is essentially a faith statement. You don't have to come to my house. I know you'll do the right thing. I know that my servant, if it's right, will be healed. And he didn't say it outright, but the implication is, I know that if it's right, he won't be. True faith always leads to that kind of humility before Jesus. True faith can always say, not my will, but yours be done. So, there's a couple of observations. Now let's draw some principles from the story and from those observations. The first that I'd like to make is that we can and should intercede for unbelievers. It starts with a group of Jewish elders coming to Jesus asking a favor for somebody who's not Jewish, someone who's outside their faith community. And they prayed that Jesus would intercede, and we can do the same thing. I'm really excited. I'm proud about the Sunday school class here in this church that has made a list of people they know who are not believers and have agreed to pray together for those people. And I would encourage every believer in this room every believer who's seeing this on the internet, to have a list of people they know are not believers. I've got seven on my list. People that I'm praying for every time I have my devotions and my prayers, I pray that God will somehow bring them into his kingdom. I encourage you to have a few people on your list. The challenge to that is, though, once you've been a believer for about two years or so, statistically speaking, you look around and the only people you know are already believers. So if you sit down and you try to make a list of people you know who aren't believers, it's hard to do. So instead of asking God to give you uh, someone's salvation, to, to save somebody in response to your prayers, ask him to give you five people you know are not believers, that you can begin to pray for their salvation. And watch how Jesus guides you to those people. Second principle that I'd like to point out this morning is faith is not a blind leap. I'm always impressed when I think about faith with that movie, um, Indiana Jones. Remember that that guy? He's standing on the, the cliff in that first movie, and there's this huge chasm in front of him, and he's mumbling about faith. He says, a, a, a man of faith makes blind leaps. A man of faith uh, takes a leap in the dark, and then he... Re- steps out into that chasm, and instead of falling, the Hollywood special effects catches him, and he can walk across this chasm. That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is always rooted in reality. And this centurion knew enough about Jesus and his reliability and his mode of operation that he knew he could trust Jesus to heal his servant. He knew Jesus had that ability But he also recognized Jesus' authority, if he knew it was right, to say no. That's real faith. Now, we have the Scripture that we can base our understanding of Jesus on. But we have our own life and our own testimony and what other people uh, have told us in their testimonies to base our understanding of who Jesus is and what he might do and his reliability We have a lot more than the centurion had on which to base our faith. Principle number three this morning is Jesus admires the faith of those who would struggle to believe. You know, it's hard to trust when you've had your childhood violated. It's hard to trust when you've stood in front of a whole congregation and said, until death do us part, but somebody left. 
It's hard to trust when you hire on with a boss who promises you vacations and time off and pay raises and bonuses and he doesn't come through. Almost all of us have a reason not to trust. But Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus admires even more those who have a reason to doubt. That centurion had every reason to think, Jesus is going to reject me. I'm not a Jew. He could say no to me, and the whole, the whole country would praise him for it. But he still trusted Jesus. That kind of trust is hard. But, God, but Jesus admires that in a person. Last one here. Jesus responds in unexpected ways to real faith. He didn't wave his hand over the sickness. He didn't uh, make a broad declaration. He just responded to the faith by leaving and healing the servant. Sometimes when we take a risk of faith, he'll respond. Sometimes not in the way that we expect. See, real faith impresses Jesus. Real faith impresses Jesus, just like the centurion's faith. Our faith can impress Jesus. So how? How do we impress Jesus? Well, the right response is to strengthen your faith. Make your faith stronger. That's scary. That's terrifying. Because it's going to mean taking some risks. It's going to mean taking the risk with your time. And setting aside a certain amount of time to get to know Jesus better. A certain number of minutes on a daily basis to be in his word. And to uh, read even though you don't feel like you read well. Read anyway. To pray even though you have a hard time focusing. But pray anyway. To obey, even when obeying is hard. It, it's going to require some risks in your relationships. I mean, I mean, we've all felt it. Let's just be honest. I've been there. Uh, I've got this guy. He's not a believer. Everybody in town knows he's not a believer. He's a creep, really. Do I really want to be seen in the restaurant with him? What are people going to think? Am I willing to risk my reputation so Jesus has a chance to work through me? It takes, a, it, it takes some risk to in, enhance our faith, to grow our faith. And I'm not going to blow smoke. It's hard. It's difficult to take those risks. Our lives condition us not to trust. Our lives condition us to protect ourselves, to protect what we have, to keep it close, to not let go of it. It's hard, but it is possible. Jesus, uh, this, this is what blows me away. Jesus allows fresh starts. He allows for us to try again. You know, I was thinking this week about the fall of Jerusalem. Back in the Old Testament times, Babylon won. Jerusalem is going into exile. And Jeremiah sat outside of town and wrote a series of poems that we call the Book of Lamentations. And right in the middle of that book, it's five chapters long, halfway through chapter three, Jeremiah says, his mercies are new Every morning, we get a fresh start every time we wake up. You know, John, the apostle, disagreed with that. Did you know that? In 1 John chapter 1, John said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John said we didn't have to wait till morning. All we have to do is confess. That word confess means agree. Yeah, that was the wrong thing to do, God. I realize that now. And God will wipe you clean and start over right then. 
it doesn't matter what you've done. You get a fresh start right then. It's risky, but Jesus will validate that risk. He will make that risk worth it. He'll answer your prayers. You know, I, I, we steal ourselves when we pray for the, the word no. But you know, that's the answer. That's one of the answers that God gives. It means he's listened. Sometimes he says, wait. And we get impatient. And we wonder why God won't answer and we give up. But sometimes he says yes. And he gives it to us right away. He answers all of our prayers. Sometimes it takes a little extra effort to find that answer. He'll comfort your souls. One of the um, biggest challenges that I hear to people's faith is death. I prayed for years that the cancer would be cured. And they didn't survive. Unfortunately... Sometimes we have to face the reality. You know, there's only two people in the history of the world that got off of this world alive. Jesus did not even get off this world without dying first. Sometimes God has to say no. But he doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't get angry with you because you asked. He gives you comfort. Sometimes you can feel the spirit in your heart saying, I'm still here. You're not alone. Sometimes you, he'll bring passages to the, from the Bible to your mind, or he'll have somebody from the church call and say, hey, we're just thinking of you. You're, we're still praying for you. You're not alone. And we'll get that comfort. Sometimes we'll get a strength of, strengthening of convictions. You know, uh, one of the soapboxes that I get on quite a bit is that word faith. That I think that many times in the Bible it's not translated correctly. In fact, the majority of times it's not translated correctly. The, the Greek concept, the, the language concept of faith is more accurately translated trust in most contexts. But I didn't come to that overnight. It started out with me saying, I, I don't know if my faith is right. I wonder if I even understand what faith is. So I started looking up the commentaries and the lexicons on the word faith. And I found this concept that it, in, it includes a, a strong aspect of trust. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I started reading through the scripture. And as I read through the scripture, I'd find that word faith. And I'd say, I better go check and see if it's the same word. And every time it was, the context fit trusting God. So over a pe period of years... By searching for God's mind, I came to the conviction and strengthened the conviction that if we believe faith is a leap in the dark, if we believe faith is saying, I'll believe what's irrational, even if it's irrational, that's the wrong concept of faith from the biblical perspective. The biblical perspective is Jesus said it so. That's why I trust it. You might validate your risk in trusting him by reminding you of the truth. The truth that we need a savior. The truth that that savior wants to be our Lord. And as he's our Lord, he wants to be our provider and our protector. Because you see, every single believer in Jesus Christ came through the same door. I counted them up this morning. There's, there's six different doorways you can get into this church. There's only one doorway for getting in to the kingdom of God. And that's through the cross. Through what Jesus did for you on the cross. When he took God's wrath and left no more wrath for those people who trust in him. I, have to tell, I know I'm a little over time, but I got to tell you this. One of the most significant verses in the entire Bible on what faith really is for me is John 3.36. It's John the Baptist speaking. And he says, anyone who believes in the Son, that's that word faith, belief. Anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. But anyone who does not obey the Son, the root word of that word obey is also faith. It's the only time it appears in that form in the entire Bible and it, it, all the commentators, all the lexicons agree that that word means to be so convinced of the truth that it changes the way you live. 
Anyone who does not obey the Son will never see life. Never see life because the wrath of God abides on him. And so God leaves us with a choice. Do we trust him and receive eternal life and the abundant life and the comfort of answered prayer and the fellowship of other believers? Or are we going to be so stubborn we're going to do it our own way and never see life? Folks, in a room this size, there's probably somebody in here who is dying to run to the front and get some answers to questions. That in, that in itself is scary. So just, just walk up here afterwards. And if you have questions about that, we'll talk. And I'll show you why you can trust Jesus. Because Jesus is impressed. He admires that kind of faith. That kind of faith that will step out and say whatever you want to do. However you want to do it, I know it'll be right.